Hi, this is Josh Culp. I'm back in uh, my warm country in Israel, hence only a t-shirt. Uh, done with my wonderful trip to America, but I'll be coming again soon and I hope to see as many of you as possible. Um, we're on Daf Yud Dalet of Masechet, of, uh, Masechet Kiddushin, um, and uh, we're moving on to another Mishnah in the second half of this Daf about the Eved Ivri, the Hebrew slave. So I wanted to talk about the three passages in the Torah that talk about the Hebrew slave, but also I want to sort of reiterate what I wrote a few times in my commentary, that by rabbinic times, rabbis did not practice the institution of the Hebrew slave, uh, meaning that there was no sort of uh, halachic existence of a Jew owning another Jew as a slave. I don't know historically, I can't say that historically no Jews owned other Jews as slaves. That's beyond the scope of, 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 of my knowledge. But what I can say is that the rabbis don't imagine that this institution exists anymore in their time. Uh, they do uh, discuss here and there uh, rabbis and other people owning non-Jewish slaves. Slavery was common in the ancient world, um, so we shouldn't be surprised that they owned some slaves. Um, whether the conditions of these slaves were good or not, it, it's hard to tell. I, I will say that they didn't have large plantations like they did in the South, the American South, uh, and most of these slaves seem to have been more like uh, full-time servants in their homes. But the institution of slavery did exist in the rabbinic period. Anyway, about the slave. Um, the Hebrew slave appears in three Parshiot, three passages in the Torah, which makes it sort of ripe for um, for biblical criticism, because we can compare what does a passage in Exodus say, what does a passage in Devarim, Deuteronomy say, and what does a passage in Leviticus say. And these three sources come, according to biblical scholars, from three different sources. And of course, the rabbis either harmonize them, or in this case, some of the rabbis do not harmonize them and say that they refer to two different types of slaves. But just to get to the pshat, uh, uh, the simple meaning of these passages, the first one is in the beginning of Parshat to Mishpatim in um, Exodus 21, and there we read the following rules. Uh, an Eved Ivri, a Hebrew slave, should work for six years, and on the seventh year he goes free. Uh, his master can give him a wife. Um, the pshat seems to be any wife. The problem with this is uh, what right does a master have? to just decide that a woman should marry his, uh, his slave. So the rabbis always interpret this quite convincingly as a female slave. In other words, the, um, the master can pair him up with a female slave, and if he does, the children belong to the master. Um, and most importantly about this passage, he can choose, this slave can choose to remain free, uh, to, go, to remain a slave forever, and he has his right ear. Ald, and that's a sign that he chose to uh, uh, remain a slave. Uh, we don't know why, how this person ended up becoming a slave, but I will note that Exodus 22 refers to a chapter, chapter 22, verse 2 refers to a thief who was sold because of his slavery, um, because of his thievery, uh, excuse me. Uh, in other words, there's a notion in the Torah that if a thief cannot pay back the debt of what he stole, he can be sold for the um, uh, uh, injured party to recover that debt. So that's how the rabbis interpret this passage. The rabbis interpret this passage to refer to a, a Jew who was sold to recover a debt that he incurred while um, stealing something. Now, Deuteronomy 15, um, 12 is very similar, uh, except there's a couple differences. First of all, Deuteronomy 15 does not distinguish between a male and a female slave, and Exodus 21 does. Um, this slave goes free in the seventh year, like the slave in Exodus does, but there's no option here to stay. Finally, the other major key difference is in uh, Devarim, we read that the, a gift must be given to him, that the master, upon his departure, must give him sort of a, 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 a parachute, probably not a golden parachute like CEOs get, but he must give him some kind of departing gift. Um, rabbis, generally speaking, will read this passage as being a complementary to Exodus 21, and that both refer to a slave... <coughs> who was sold because of thievery. 
Now, Leviticus 25, um, 39 and forward is completely different. Um, and this refers to a slave who was sold because of his poverty. Uh, and the rabbis interpret this as somebody who sells himself because he is in dire poverty. Um, they add that a person can only sell himself into slavery if he really has nothing, right? only a little bit to eat, nothing beyond just a little bit to eat, but has no possessions whatsoever. Otherwise, um, a person is not allowed to sell themselves into slavery. Um, this slave, we don't read about going free in the seventh year. Only read that he goes free in the Jubilee, and there is no option to stay. Um, he also goes out with his kids. It's unclear what kids these are. These are Were they born from a female slave? Were they born from his wife? That's a little bit unclear. But the passage is somewhat different than the verses in Exodus and the verses in Deuteronomy. Uh, you'll see on this page uh, uh, two different opinions, one that offers a significant harmonization and one that doesn't really harmonize them. Of course, nobody, uh, no rabbis think that they contradict each other. Um, they just think that they refer to different situations. Uh, rabbis, generally speaking, will not read uh, verses as contradicting each other. I would think that they would never read them. Biblical scholars attribute these to different time periods in Israelite history, different um, uh, 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 types of codes, different ethical codes, um, uh, some one earlier, the one in, in, in Shemot being the earliest. Um, but um, because they appear in all three books, it's a ripe passage for biblical criticism. It's also a ripe passage for rabbinic midrash, which I would often read as uh, complementing one another. Good luck learning, and uh, look forward to talking to you next week.